Hello everyone and welcome to another round of highlights today and uh, I'm just going to get started uh, and let's jump right in. Okay, the first one is uh, from Think Again. The single most important driver of forecaster success was how often they updated the beliefs. The best forecasters went through more rethinking cycles. They had the confident humility to doubt their judgments and the curiosity to discover new information that led them to revise their predictions. Um, the author is talking about the different forecasters, uh, as in the dif uh, different experts in the field who would predict something that would happen and then that indeed does happen. And uh, the the most important driver for, you know, distinguishing that, okay, these are the forecasters and uh, as in they, they turned out to be right. The, the most important driver was how often they updated their beliefs. It was not somebody who stuck to their beliefs saying that, uh, and you know, that, it doesn't sound good when I say put it that way, uh, but um, stay with me. It, it's not about, you know, how you, you stay with the method that's clearly no longer working or the situation that has changed, but how often you keep updating your beliefs and you know, when the situation changes, you put aside your ego and adopt that, okay, uh, or oh, the situation has changed. What I said earlier doesn't count anymore. So my predictions must change along with it. And that turns out to be the most important driver for their success. You know, people who keep updating their beliefs, they were better able to predict what, what happened next. So uh, the phrase, you know, the confident humility, it's its like I said, you know, putting the ego as, aside for this. It's difficult, you know, uh, if you have a certain standing in any space, it's very difficult for uh, for you to kind of change your mind about something. So uh, putting that ego aside, have the confident humility to doubt our judgments and say that, okay, no, I was not right earlier. I think this is what's going to happen now, depending on what's changed. Let's go on. The molecule of more. The happy error is what launches dopamine into action. It's not the extra time or the extra money themselves. It's the thrill of unexpected good news. Right. So it's talking about what really uh, what really drives dopamine action into our brain in our brains. It's not the extra time or the extra money. It's not something that okay. It's not the reward that you get uh, when doing something. It's it's not that. It's the thrill of the unexpected good news. It's the reward, and that's why you know there is this uh, the book often mentions another phrase, reward prediction error. That is, you thought that certain, something would happen, but you got a pleasant surprise. And that's what kicks dopamine into action. And of course, it it, it has a lot of uh, consequences, the way dopamine behaves like this. So for example, again, the book goes into uh, talking about this, you know, kind of dopamine establishes certain baseline if it gets kicked often enough. For example, um, using drugs. It does launch. Uh, it does, uh, you know, uh, shoot. A, it does. Uh, what's the what's the phrase for that? Um, using drugs would introduce a boost of dopamine, but then it would increase the baseline, and then you would need more and more. Uh, you need you would need to keep using drugs to feel the effect of dopamine because the baseline has increased. Anyway, I think I'm going little. I'm, I'm digressing a little, uh, but the point over there is that addiction. Um, and I'm not an expert on addiction, but you know, uh, again, the, the way I understood it from this book is that addiction happens for this reason, because the dopamine level has increased and now you just need more and more, uh, you just need to keep using drugs more and more to, uh, feel that thrill again and again, because your, your baseline has increased now. Well, uh, so, uh, let, let's move on. Guide to organization design. I think this has not come up before. Structural decisions usually loom larger in leaders' minds than other decisions related to organization design. But it is a mistake, often a costly one, to focus a design on challenges, uh, to focus a design on changes in the structure. I think what the author really talks about is that when we're really worried, worried about the organization design, structure is not that important as we often think it is, you know, and structure refers to, of course, the hierarchy and, uh, you know, who's reporting to whom and everything. And when we change the organization design or when we are thinking about what the organization should look like, we often think of structure and it's a mistake. You know, uh, there are m many more other important things that drive an organization design um, apart from structure and they are, they tend to be more important ones. 
and of course the book goes a lot into it and i don't think i can do justice over here so if you're interested in this topic of course you know go read this book i'll put a link in the description but let's move on for now signs of overcoming procrastination busy procrastinators busy procrastinators want to do it all all at once in their attempt to cover everything they feel to actually get anything done their to do list is crammed with tasks that all appear equally important to them thus they typically start on one task feel overwhelmed by the seeming urgency of another jump to that other task and then again think of another task they really have to get started on jump on a different task again and so on um <laughs> it it is it is scary how much this uh, this matches my behavior uh right so prioritization it really comes down to that you know are you uh, to be productive you have to prioritize and if you're not able to prioritize you end up in the cycle of procrastination as this highlight is demonstrating so uh for someone like me it's a very important thing to understand that you know just because you have so many important tasks um it's not going to do you Uh, do you any good if you're going to keep just just all of them at equal priority in your to do list? And this kind of links into what we have been talking about in uh, you know while uh, reading highlights from getting things done as well. So um, yeah, it, it is like I said, it is kind of scary and unnerving how closely this matches my behavior. <laughs> um, all right, uh, well of course you know it's like reading things like this then. Uh, it, it's like reading things like these that kind of help me understand you know see what i'm doing and uh, avoid doing that in the first place right so yeah let's move on mind for numbers writing and seeing what you're trying to learn seems to enhance retention uh, so and the author is really talking about writing with hands you know not not typing it down you know using pen and paper to write down something so writing and seeing it improves retention because you're applying that unusual amount of effort in writing something down on paper and your mind just follows that your brain just follows that that's how brains are wired you know things that we do with uh, with our hand with such intimate level uh, rather than just type pressing keys on keyboard it, it like you know it's it's better than doing nothing you know putting things on keyboard but <clears throat> really to improve retention pen and paper is the ultimate tool then um yeah let's move on remote not distant company culture design should be treated just as intentionally as designing a new product it should start and end with the user in mind turning it into a co-creation process and of course you know i've heard things similar to this um, all the time but really um as in i have kept hearing that uh, and we understand that okay culture design should be intentional it's it's not that okay culture just comes together in an office um it should be intentional even if you are in an in person office the culture design should be intentional and the interesting thing for me over here was that it should be as intentional as designing a new product and they're linking with an user in end user in the mind and of course in in an organization the end user is the employee and turning it into a co-creation process so you know the agile methods of working and everything uh we have this that we build a mvp we put it out to users get real feedback and then keep evolving our product that's that's a very regular way of building software right now start with like the minimum viable product mvp and keep adding features based on what user needs you know keeping user in the mind and turning it into co creation the users the our customers are creating the product along with us culture design should be as intentional as that and that's the point of this i highlight that the employee they should be they should have a stake in creating the culture of the organization and it's difficult especially difficult on remote but it's worth it you know and and really those are the cultures that stick it is it is too important to be left to chance um the organization that i work with accelerant i know like i've been over i've been over here for about 9 years now and culture has been the forefront of conversation since the beginning you know since i have joined um and i won't go too deep into that right now but again you know it's like it started off from a small organization so employees were involved in the culture de- uh, design from the beginning and it has kind of stuck so yeah it, it, this this highlight intrigued me in that way you know like the drawing the parallel to the to like designing a new product uh, let's go on effortless teaching others is also an accelerated way to learn even thinking we might 
be, even thinking we might be called upon to teach can increase our engagement we focus more intently we listen to understand we think about the underlying logic so we can put the ideas into our own words right i i i yeah this uh, i can completely relate to this i often say you know i've, I've uh, spoken about mentorship before not on these videos but uh, you know in in conferences and i often said see this um, uh, this quote when one teaches to learn so teaching others is a, also an accelerated way to learn if you want to learn something just teach i, I know of many people who say that they do this they um if they want to learn some, some new technology they just submit a talk to the local meetup in that technology you know they just submit like an introductory talk for that so now when they know that they are going to talk about this in that meetup or in that conference they learn better and because they give that talk they gain a completely different perspective into what they are learning so yeah uh, i think it is underrated how um, how useful teaching is as a method of learning uh, we'll move on book the box when you late there's no there's not a lo lot of room for choice or decision or initiative when you late the path is well lit and the choices are clear run run down the path you've run down before um so i think uh, yep the highlight is pretty straightforward i think um the the point of the book is you know you're start something before you have to right uh, you know plan ahead and just get into the habit of starting things uh, so the highlight is kind of contrasting that okay you know when when uh, when somebody else has already done this and you're late there's not a lot of room or choice or decision you know there's no not a lot of room there's no time left and you're just running down a path you're not really um you're not really kind of uh you don't have the luxury anymore of thinking what you're going to do now so yeah the the point of the book uh, i think i'm kind of like circling around in my thoughts over here right now uh, and that's okay but uh, it's it's let, let me just get back to this highlight again it's it's about the importance of starting on uh, starting early you know starting often enough so that you're getting used to, you're you're used to the idea of starting frequently and um, the the highlight is of course contrasting to the the behavior that you would otherwise see that if you don't do this often enough there will be a time that you will have no choice but to start and then no room to uh, you know think about it you just have to run down a path without uh, without actually seeing what you're building you know without innovating without bringing anything that that's, that's actually adding a value add to the process you're just now you're not just running to catch up rather than running to stay ahead so yeah let's move on student focus i realized then that to recover from our loss of attention it is not enough to strip out our distractions that will just create a void we need to strip out our distractions and to replace them with sources of flow and that's quite clear um, i mean the highlight is quite clear but it's not very clear in our behaviors we sometimes remove distractions but then we are lost with okay you know uh okay what do i do now and i, I think you know this, this kind of reflects in many things i've heard that okay you know uh, the, uh, that um some people say that i like clutter because it gives me something to do uh, and if there is no clutter they're lost you know as in like okay what do i do now you know like there's no clutter what what should i do next so that's the distraction you know the clutter was there to distract you it was succeeding and um we got so uh, we, we relied so much on the clutter to do anything really so we just needed that in our space that okay you know there's no clutter i can't do my work but that's really that's really distracting us from what we should be paying our attention to right so to to effectively remove clutter and keep uh, you know you have to replace it with sources of flow and the book goes on to describe you know what that might look like but yeah like the point of this highlight is that you know it's not just enough to remove distractions you have to replace that with something we human beings we don't do well with void we can't uh, process void effectively or or uh, you know we, we we can't really productively handle void we are lost we uh, you know like that's why they say you know the, our brains react more to the positive than the negative so uh, for example it's not that um 
remove all negative thoughts from your mind. You have to replace it with positive thoughts. Um, that's 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 really what it ties into. Let's move on. Principles. To be principled means to consistently operate with principles that can be clearly explained. I think it's a pretty straightforward highlight. It's like, of course, the book is excellent about, you know, um, like covering of, you know, um, uh, the the princi principles in general, like that name says, I don't know what else to talk about this. But uh, yeah, you know, it, it's just, just because you have principles it doesn't change anything. Uh, what matters is to consistently operate with principles that can be clearly explained, you know, that are like, for example, documented, you know, so if it's an organizational principle, they are documented, they are available to everybody and they can see that, okay, this is how we operate, uh, kind of like uh, corporate values, that kind of thing. We'll move on and uh, shoe dog. Okay. Have, I, I don't know what is this. Have faith in yourself, but also have faith in faith, not faith as others define it, faith as you define it, faith as faith defines itself in your heart. I have no context about this. So I think I'm going to just, um, I mean, the quote is intriguing, but I, I don't really have any context to talk about it. So that marks the end of uh, another highlight today and um, well, I don't really have much to say at this point. Uh, I am still thinking of different ways I can approach this whole exercise, you know, I've considered shorts. Uh, I just don't think, you know, like I can operate in the time limit of short or if that will be relevant. But, you know, if you have thoughts about this, please let me know. And uh, I think that's it for today then. Have a good day.